views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Right ahead on this initial perspective, we go front and center with the issue of COVID-19. How is disproportionately affecting communities of color? We're going to have a government official, Assembly Member Natalia Fernandez. She's going to share with us the government's response and what we need to know here in the borough of the Bronx. Stay with us, Perspectives starts now. What's on your mind? Let know. What's on your mind? What's on your Let mind? Let know. Anything relevant to life, you bring it to the table. Whether you make a move solo or a movement with a stable. No fables, you speak on your decisions. Because in the long run, it's your voice, your views, your vision. Keeping it real with many messages for you to know. This ain't radio, but DJ runs the show. Entertainment, he rocks it. Politics, he locks it. The host with the most would handle any topic. Don't forget to share your perspective which shines a light. Because it might make a difference in someone else's life. Make a difference What's your perspective? What's your and hello everyone and welcome to Perspectives. I am Darren Jaime. Of course, we thank you for joining us. As always, you can catch Perspectives every week here on Bronx's Channel 67, Verizon Files, that'll be Channel 33, or anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. We encourage you also to stay connected to us on all of our social media platforms at BronxNet TV, where we continue to bring you the news, the information, and the things that you need to know. And of course, as you see us right now, you know that we're not in the studio, but it is our aim and our goal and our purpose to continue to give Bronxites in New York City as much information, as much content as possible, as we talk virtually about the things that are going on here in our city in these troubled times. When we talk about New York City, of course, the hotbed, the epicenter across the country for COVID-19. When we talk about the numbers for people are being affected by COVID-19, it disproportionately is affecting communities of color. We knew that in the beginning. We're now starting to see the numbers actually start to shape up. For a better look at the numbers in New York City, uh, Latinos represent 34% of the people who have died in, due to coronavirus, but only make up 29% of the city's population. Blacks, African Americans, 28% of the deaths and only make up 22% of the population. And so the question is, what's going on? What do we need to know? And how can we better arm ourselves during a time such as this? I'm pleased to be joined by a very special guest who's sharing with us and sharing and continuing to lend her voice uh, to what's going on, Assemblymember Natalia Fernandez. And she is from the 80th Assembly District right here in the borough of the Bronx. And uh, Assemblymember Fernandez, good to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, pleasure to be here today. I'm you know, happy just to be able to communicate and share thoughts and facts uh, you know, with my community. So as we talk about COVID-19, I guess the question is, what are your thoughts given the fact that uh, these numbers lend the way they are? Um, in short, my thoughts have kind of been all over the place because uh, as much as I'm trying to keep the community calm and at ease, you know, with the facts that we have, at the same time, at least me, I'm a little worried too, like what could happen next? Like what could happen that we're not expecting, you know, as much as we can say we weren't prepared for this pandemic, uh, you know, maybe the numbers might go back up. But um, I've been happy to see that the numbers are going down, you know, every day for the last maybe five days, we've seen the, the number of hospitalizations and deaths go down. They're still extremely high. I think today the report was between like 400 and 500 deaths yesterday. So a big drop from the almost 800 that we had last week. But, you know, we're still we're still trying to get through the worst of it. Um, and, you know, I, I credit the the Swiftish leadership <laughs> um, mm -hmm. getting us to this p place. But it's been a roller coaster, you know, the community and including myself with everyone really was shocked when this really started picking up fast. And, you know, every day there was a new update and a new regulation made a new closure. Like uh, it's just been uh, a chase really, at least for myself, making sure that I'm catching every email, every message, every situation, concern, you know, in touch with my staff all day, because I am having, you know, daily conversations with the mayor's office, with the governor's office. And I want to be able to relay 
what's happening here on the ground, not just in the hospitals and, you know, what other reports are saying, but what's happening to us, you know, the community and how we're getting through it. So right. it's been a lot. What, what, what are you, and what are you hearing from boots on the ground from people in the community? Because um, as I know, your assembly district covers several hospitals. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. But what are you hearing from people on the ground, your, your constituents? Uh, a lot of different things and things that have been an issue, you know, two weeks ago that are not so much an issue now. So like when it first started and, you know, schools weren't closed yet, I was getting an influx of, of parents and community residents. Why aren't the schools closed? We're seeing this is spreading. Our kids are already kind of dirty, you know, playgrounds are dirty. So, you know, uh, the concerns were, were daily, new things uh, every every day, every week. So like when the schools finally closed, a big issue was getting the, the tablets and, and access to remote learning and setting that up. You know, I completely um, understand the the challenge that the school system had to do in basically recreating a curriculum in a day or two and making sure that now teachers can properly and efficiently teach the kids over um, over internet. And then, you know, the parents too. Some parents were like, I'm working a job from home. I have to teach my kids as well, but I also have to you know, I'm a single mom, I got to shop and, and, and clean in the house, like it's just a lot. So there, on top of the request, you know, of like, how can I get a tablet now? How can I get internet? How can I get meals? Because remember before the schools were only giving meals to students that needed it because the reason why we didn't close the schools right away is because we know that students depend on the school meals. Sometimes that's the only meals that they'll get in a day. Um, but that quickly evolved to the fact that it's not just students that need meals and, you know, we're losing uh, the, the aid that they had before when life was normal. So, uh, in hearing, you know, and getting those requests from seniors that are not necessarily seniors, you know, DIFTA was, um, doing meal deliveries, but you had to be 60 and older. So I had someone that was 59, 58. They're like, what do I do? So it's a lot of, you know, little, uh, loopholes that people have fallen through that, you know, needed help getting back out. One big issue that still hasn't been resolved, but um, thankfully, uh, my Congress member spoke out in a press conference, I think a few days ago, uh, regarding funeral costs. And that was, you know, one of the saddest things to hear that people are, are losing family members and the hospitals, you know, on top of them being bombarded with the dead bodies, not knowing, you know, where to put it, seeing them in refrigerator trucks. Now a family have, has 14 days, before it was 30, to claim a body from the hospital. Now they have 14 days to claim your body and then figure out what you want to do with it. Cremated, burial, like funeral, all that. So our funeral homes are inundated right now and families just simply don't have the funds. You know, this was something that was unexpected. You're hearing cases of someone getting sick on a Tuesday and next Tuesday, you know, critical condition, maybe the next day gone. So this is happening really fast and families don't have the $10,000 to bury someone. So I've gotten a number of calls. What do I do? What's out there? What can help me? Like, where can I get a loan or grant something? Because I want my brother, my mother, anyone, you know, resting respectfully. Mm -hmm. So we've been asking that. It's not even just me. Many members have, you know, related to the governor's office, the mayor's office. And it's really tough on the state. And this is where, you know, I... I agree with, with the governor in saying we're broke. We have no money, you know? So to say, okay, we're gonna now dedicate $100 million for funeral costs, it's physically impossible. And we've been saying it since day one, we're gonna need the federal government to help. And before the first stimulus package came out, you know, that was part of the conversation. Well, what about this issue? What about this issue? But we saw what happened, you know, politics fighting and those across the aisle kind of holding and, and demanding A, B, or C. And this first package didn't include that. So um, the issue, of course, has only grown. And I'm hearing more and more that it will be, there will be something in the next stimulus package to help with this, some sort of financial relief. Because I think for families to at least keep their dignity and, you know, the city to keep its dignity, that needs to be something that needs to be helped with. You know, it's yeah. no one's fault that they got the virus. Um, oh. I mean, I want to stop myself for a second because if you're not social distancing and taking right. measures, then you might just, you know, let yourself get it. But however it affects you, you know, it, it's not your fault. 
Right, so, and, and that's true. It's, it's, it's not it's not someone's fault. And now, coming up after the break, I want to talk to you a little bit about testing uh, because a lot of questions are still about testing, and uh, we'll talk about testing sites. So we're going to take a quick break here on Perspectives. Be right back right after this. Who's most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov. Continue our conversation here on Perspectives with Assemblywoman Natalia Fernandez talking about how her district and how she is a government official is really dealing and navigating with COVID-19. We're glad that we can bring you this show virtually where we can bring you news and information and the things that really are, are making a difference, particularly in this time. And so, uh, Assemblywoman Fernandez, thank you again for taking the time to share with us. Uh, as we get into the issue of testing, I want to talk about testing, particularly in our communities, right? Uh, we know that the Bronx has majority communities of color uh that's where we're seeing a lot of you know a lot of uh, infection and and people being affected but testing that's been a big a, a big concern in testing sites uh we know that we have one by lehman college and that's right you know not too far from us in other places are you satisfied with what you're seeing by way of testing sites and the ability for broad sites to be able to get to these sites because what i've heard with boots on the ground is some people are saying listen it's hard for me to get to a testing site if i want to get tested i gotta take a bus and a train and that risks exposure as well absolutely the testing i think has been um a more difficult area that as we've gone through it because you know, as soon as we opened up testing sites, I was fortunate uh, to have one in my district at Jacoby Hospital, and they're still doing some testing, but they, they had a, a pop-up uh, drive-through site. Now they're accepting walk-ins and some drive-through. Uh, Lehman is great too, but when that one popped up and, you know, we had Jacoby and Lincoln Hospital was, was doing it, you know, it still left a lot of areas that weren't being reached. Uh, we saw Co-op City then got a testing site and, you know, which was great because that's such a heavily dense population there. But the conversation quickly came and I, I credit my, my South Bronx colleagues for making the, the need known of a testing site in the South Bronx. You know, that's uh, the South Bronx is more affected by asthma, uh, you know, given the historical architectural design of the city with uh, by Robert Moses. Um, and it's known that, you know, health is lower in the South Bronx. And then as we've come to learn more that this is a respiratory issue, you know, it, it's, it's known and can only be assumed that those that have respiratory issues might, you know, hurt more from this if they get the, if they get the disease. So to have walk, uh, more testing sites in the Bronx and in the city was really important. But even the fact that they needed to be walking, uh, you know, able to walk in because, when Lehman popped up and and I think they were talking for a drive-in site somewhere in the South Bronx at one point, you know, it, it wasn't even about like, okay, you're going to have testing, but can people walk and, and get a test, you know? And yeah. even before that, it was even difficult. I, I, and I speak for my own staff because I had two staff members that, uh, you know, got infected by the virus and they had symptoms and, you know, we're calling the hotline and the hotline 
um, you know, when they opened it, I guess they didn't have enough people accepting the calls. So some people weren't getting through. So, you know, as things are, are being developed, they're being tested and bettered. And it was frustrating for a lot of people. And even myself, when I thought I had it for like a day, because, uh, you know, I knew I was in contact with somebody that had it and I had a running nose for like a week. And then I started feeling a tight chest and I'm like, oh my God, is this the shortness of breath? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And, you know, thankfully I, I, I never got it. Um, but in, when I called the hotline, like they kind of just, well, you assess yourself. Do you think you need to go? Wow. Yeah. Like literally told me those words. So I'm like, I'm not a doctor and I don't know this disease. So I'm asking you to assess me and what I'm just sharing. And, you know, I felt a little discouraged in that first call. And granted that call I made when the hotline like just opened. Um, but even now I have some constituents like, you know, I'm trying to get an appointment. I, I, I can't smell, you know, I, I, I can't breathe. I, I have fever and I feel like I have every symptom, but I'm still being told to maybe wait it out. So I think that's been a big problem because you know, not only does a test verify that if you have it and, you know, you can then be ready to get, you know, the necessary treatment or have the necessary treatment, like, you know, prepared, understanding that you might go into very hardness of breathing and need a ventilator. It also kind of just eases your mentality a little bit, you know, because that was my fear. I'm like, I don't know if I have it. I don't know if I'm able to, to go outside or to talk to somebody. Maybe I'm a carrier. I don't know what that means being a carrier. You know, will I ever have a symptom? Maybe I'm asymptomatic and I have it because we're hearing that too. So I think to, to kind of ease minds, it's helpful to get testing. But now as we're, we're getting through this peak and, you know, obviously seeing thousands of positives every day, my next question, and I know it's definitely being uh, discussed, is what to do after people recover. So as if you've been following the governor's um, press conferences, you know, we're going into antibody testing to see what, uh, what in, uh, I guess, this person's antibodies, and I'm not speaking scientifically, I'm not a scientist, right. but, you know, can someone get it again? Because, like, even my brother, my brother did get it, he was positive, and he went through it. He's like, I feel good now. He's been, like, you know, good and healthy for a week, but he's like, what's the risk of me getting it again? Like, I, I, don't, I don't know. So, you know, there's still open questions that more testing, I think, will answer. Um, and my next question that I, I'm going to reach out to the governor's office today, like, you know, he's talking about we're going to do antibody testing. How can somebody, knowing they had it, reach out to, to offer, you know, their help with their antibodies and in, in seeing, you know, what solution can come of it? But the more testing that's done, you know, the more we know how fast it's spreading. Um, and I guess understanding, too, how this affects different people, you know, maybe based on uh, your, your, your health status, uh, if you have underlying conditions or not, or preconditions, but it only helps us understand the disease more and what it's really doing to everyone. Because I've even heard so many conspiracy theories. I've had people, you know, message me videos that they find on Instagram and whatever. Like, this, look, doctor speaking that we don't even know what this disease is. This is not coronavirus. What are we treating? So, like, I'm looking at that video and I see that it was dated like maybe a month or, or so ago, and. You know, the information, I get, like I'm saying, is changing every day. We're learning something new every day. So it's, I think it can only help us to really understand and fully attack this disease. Yeah. yeah. I, want to, I want to take a quick break, but before we get into, uh, before we uh, get to the break, I want to give you a, the foresight of what we're going to be talking about just in the last, because uh, one thing that's really big in our, in our borough is small business, and they've been adversely affected. So coming up after the break, I want to take a question about small businesses your take on how they're affected and what we can do in terms of strengthening that uh, in the midst of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Be back with more with Assemblywoman Fernandez when we return right here on Perspectives.
to have uh, Assemblywoman Natalia Fernandez sharing with us, sharing a little bit about what's going on in the borough, the Bronx, her particular district. And uh, she's given us some great insight and some, into a variety of different things. I want to talk about small business, if you will. Um, and small businesses are definitely uh, the lifeblood of America and certainly the lifeblood of our borough, the Bronx. It's so many of them uh, that we could talk about. But we know about this PPP program, and we know that the money didn't necessarily make it to all small businesses. First of all, your thoughts. And second of all, your concerns uh, with the fact that, you know, this, this money's already gone. Uh, my thoughts on the fact that the money's already gone is, you know, it's, oh my God, annoying. You know, like to think that, and and I can only blame now the Republicans, you know, in the House there that held it up and wanted to have this bill be the way that it would have been had the Democrats not, you know, fought for, for more, that this would have been a complete bailout for corporations, you know, um, nothing at all to come to the small businesses. And that's still what happened technically. Uh, you know, $350 billion is gone already. So it should have been calculated and known that it wouldn't be enough, you know, especially knowing that this money was going to corporations and knowing the amount of small businesses that we have that are not part of corporations, like I think it could have been uh, foresaw. Um, I think it's despicable and so insulting and, you know, almost an assault on our communities to not give any leeway or, or access to any of this help, um, you know, because the money went... Again, down through the major corporations, we're seeing, I don't know what the steakhouse is and another like chain uh, small businesses that are getting these bailouts, but it's not going to our, our mom and pop shop that's been there for 30 years, 40 years, you know, things like that. Our immigrant uh, small businesses that, you know, may not have the history of paperwork that certain businesses are being required of or all businesses are being required of. So there's a lot of catching up that we have to do to our, our small businesses and our immigrant small businesses to make sure that, you know, they're, I guess, recognizable in in the system, in, in putting in your application and that you have a real chance of getting the money. So one conversation that we've had uh, between, you know, the caucus assembly and Senate members and, and the Congressional uh, Black Hispanic Asian Caucus is to contact and figure out, you know, the community banks that are able to give these loans to the small, small businesses, the micro businesses, if you will, those that have like, you know, 20 and less, 20 or less employees. Right now, they're basically invisible in the current stimulus package. So it's really, really critical that this next package that comes out has more money and that the language is changed um, to make it sure that the smaller businesses get something out of it. Yeah. And even the immigrant, you know, undocumented businesses, like it's really um inhumane to just completely ignore a whole human population just because you know they don't have a piece of paper when they are living and, and working and contributing most of them if not all paying some sort of tax you know taxes back contributing to this economy and now when they need help too it's like well sorry i'll see you you know right Right. I got a little under three minutes, but I just got to get this question in and hopefully you can get an answer. It's a big question. So talk to me about budget, right? A lot of people are concerned. Uh, New York State is already talking about it's bankrupt, right? We know that the budget has seen massive cuts already. Um, what are your biggest fears economically for us as a city, given the fact that we're, the, you know, we're, we're ground zero for this, for this, for this virus and the, and the, and the financial economic recovery effort? My fear is that we won't recover fully, that, you know, people are going to be hurting for years uh, to come. Um, my fear is that we won't, we'll lose, you know, a lot of the historical and, and institutional uh, gems that we have in our specific communities. So, um, I mean, I'm fearful, yeah, that it's just going to take longer to fix than it took to, to get to the breaking point, you know? So, um, for the budget, you know, again, New York State is broke. We knew we had six billion dollar deficit starting session in January. That then it was already risking uh, Medicaid cuts, and to now have to pass the budget at the peak of you know this pandemic when we've lost even billions more of money, um, you know, it's just kind of I'm trying to to help you with my hands tied. I have no money, 
And, you know, everyone knows that we need federal funding, like, and that's part of one of the, the bills that we passed early on uh, to give the governor ability to kind of not play with budgets, but like if he has to either add or, or subtract anywhere throughout the year, then he has the power to do so. And that's because we're in such a difficult you know, place right now that, again, it's being figured out like as the days go on on how to, to steady um, our economy and stabilize uh, our communities. Yeah. So with just a little bit under two minutes left, talk to your constituents for a minute if they want to find ways to find out about resources and be connected. Uh, as I know, you know, it's, it's uh, the office is open. Uh, but the office is also closed as well. Yes, unfortunately, the door is closed, um, but office is still open. If anyone does contact my district office with, via the phone number, you will get an answer. Uh, staff, you know, the calls are being routed to staff and myself. So that number is 718-409-0109. We also have email open 24-7. So any concern, please email district80 at nyassembly.gov. And I'm available on social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, Fernandez 4 ny I'm trying to update constantly with, you know, whatever news is being spilled every day, any suggestions, helpful tips, even some just lightheartedness humor. Um, but I am accessible through the instant messaging there, so please feel free to contact me there. Um, and please sign up for my weekly newsletter. Uh, about, yeah, Thursdays, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I have a newsletter that comes out with updated information, uh, resources, hotline numbers. Um, and, you know, also an ability for you to just, again, reach out and ask a, a question. I'm here to help you. So any which way that you believe I can be helpful, I will help you figure out an answer. Well, certainly we want to thank you for coming and sharing with us. I think a lot of information has been shared. Um, we're all trying to navigate through this, right? This is the first time ever that this has happened in our lifetime that we're trying to deal with the pandemic. And I think that uh, we're learning a lot of things of trial and error. But certainly there's a lot of things that we can certainly do better. But thank you for the work that you're doing with boots on the ground and you continue to serve the people amidst, you know, these troubled times. Thank you so much, uh, Assemblyman Hernandez. Thank you for having me. Be safe, be well, and keep doing the good work of informing the public. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I want to thank you. And listen, I want to tell you that about wraps it up for this edition of Perspectives. I am Darren Jaime. And of course, we invite you always to share your perspective here on Bronx Nest Channel 67. For all of us here on The Sunday Show, listen, stay safe, everybody. Make sure you share your perspective with somebody else. You never know. It just might make a difference in somebody else's life. Take care and God bless. <laughs>